Hey, this is Arthur Robinson Jr. I am the creator of PowerfulInterviews.com. I am the creator of Audio Secrets Training Event. Dot com. I want to welcome each and every one of you to this phenomenal video. In this interview, you're going to experience life-changing information that you will not find anywhere else. I have secured an incredible interview with a great friend of mine, a successful businessman, the multi-millionaire. His name is Dr. Umar Johnson. Dr. Umar Johnson is a certified school psychologist, and he is a best-selling author of his phenomenal book, which is called Psycho Academic Holy Cause. So in this interview, you're going to hear exclusively how Dr. Umar Johnson, he breaks down layman's terms about reparations are only given to United Nations. Also in this interview, Dr. Umar Johnson, he breaks down layman's terms about the media is basically military science and much, much more. So remember, this is not BS information. The right information will change your situation. Wealthy people take advice from other wealthy people, and unfortunately, broke people take advice from broke people. So right about now, go get your pen and your pad, sit back and relax, and write down some notes. In this interview that I'm going to reveal to each and every one of you with my great friend, successful businessman, the certified school psychologist, the multi-millionaire, Dr. Umar Johnson. This interview, it will change your life. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So, check it out. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the one, the only, the powerful Dr. Umar Johnson to the show. Good Garby Day, my brother. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Umar, for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate me and the listeners worldwide about building wealth and about your phenomenal book, Psycho Academic Holocaust. I gladly appreciate it. Oh, thank you, my brother. The honor is mine. To everyone that's listening, I highly recommend go and get your pen and your pad right now. My great friend, Dr. Umar Johnson, is going to break down layman's terms about his phenomenal book, Psycho Academic Holocaust. Is that correct, Dr. Umar? Yes, sir. Now, what I'd like to know, and can you explain to the listeners in layman's terms, who is the powerful Dr. Umar Johnson? How long have you been in your powerful industry? And what is your expertise? Well, as you said, um, I'm a doctor of clinical psychology, certified school psychologist and principal. I evaluate children. That's what I do for a living at school psychologist. My job is to evaluate and determine whether or not children qualify for special education service, whether or not they're autistic, whether or not they're intellectually disabled, learning disabled, emotionally disturbed, and the list goes on. So that's what I do, intelligence testing, mentally gifted, I work a lot with parents. I'm president of the National Independent Black Parent Association, which is an organization that was founded last year to organize parents in every school district in America, black parents, that is, to fight against academic racism in the seven key areas of special education, school discipline, policy, finance, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. And to that end, We'll be holding our next training conference for anyone interested in becoming a president of a chapter in their area. It'll be held in Detroit, Michigan, Friday and Saturday, June the 9th and 10th from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. And folks will be able to register for that on my website, DrUmarJohnson.com. Uh, blood relative, Frederick Douglass, former Minister of Education of the Marcus Garvey Movement, uh, one of the most requested black scholars in the world. And I'm just trying to make a difference currently on a crusade to build the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, the first of several institutions that will properly prepare black boys and girls in the effective acquisition, maintenance, and protection of power, economic, militaristic, financial, intellectual, and so forth. The future belongs to those who can use their power to serve their ends. Now, Dr. Umar, can you explain to the listeners in layman's terms, I know you have another phenomenal event coming up on June the 2nd in Brooklyn, New York. Can you explain to the listeners about this phenomenal event that's coming up? Uh, Yes, sir. I'll be in Brooklyn on Saturday, 
June the 2nd, Brown Memorial Baptist Church, 52 Gates Avenue. Again, that's 52 Gates Avenue, Brown Memorial Baptist Church, Saturday, June, excuse me, Friday, 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 June the 2nd. Doors open up at 4. My message will be from 6 until 9, and then I'll sign books and take pictures from 9 until 11. Folks can get tickets, again, at my website, drumarjohnson.com, or by going to princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. And three things I'm really going to talk about in this lecture. Number one is autism, the rise on autism, the recent information that just came out where the Food and Drug Administration has admitted, but many of us have already known for years, that there's a definite link between immunizations and autism. Although they're claiming that link is only established for one particular chemical, we know that that link has been established for many of the immunizations that are given out because whistleblowers from the Food and Drug Administration has already have already relayed that information to the public. So I want to talk about autism and how parents can work with autistic children, how they can screen for autism, and how they also need to be patient before diagnosing a child with autism. In the black community, because we're largely influenced by the media and the mental health industry, and that is to get children evaluated as soon as possible. I do not agree with that when it comes to uh, mental health. I don't agree with that. I agree with that with physical health because when you're dealing with physical health, physical diseases and physical disabilities can be objectively proven. There's blood tests, there's CAT scans, there's MRIs, there are x-rays that can clearly and definitively rule in or out diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and other issues. But when you're dealing with mental illness, you're not dealing with the exact type of a science where we can prove uh, factually by way of our assessments that a person actually has this disorder. Because you're dealing with mental science, there is a margin of error because all diagnoses that we give out our professional opinions at the end of the day. So I want to educate parents on autism. And then we want to deal with ADHD, which is a big, giant monster in the black community that is consuming the lives of so many black boys on a regular basis. This monster came to us in the 1980s from the American Psychiatric Association, and it has literally wrecked havoc in our community like a mental health hurricane where mm. so many black boys are being diagnosed with ADHD, conduct disorder, opposition of defiant disorder. But the diagnosis is not the biggest problem. It's the medication, the medication that comes with it, the Ritalin, the Adderall, the Stratera, the Cycler, these dangerous, dangerous drugs that leave oftentimes irreversible side effects in the children that take them. So I want to raise awareness about that, raise awareness about how it has now become easier to diagnose ADHD under the new DSM. And then I want to talk about the state of the race. We as black people, politically, economically, socially, and intellectually, where are we as a people right now? 100 52 years since the end of slavery, on August the 21st of 2019, we will be celebrating our 400th year in America, counting from the beginning of slavery in the 13 colonies, Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. So August the 21st of 2019 will mark 400 years. How far have we really come? Wow. The Umar, you have a powerful presence, and when you speak, people all over the world listen because you you don't only practice what you preach; you are the message. Now, can you explain to the listeners? I know, as brown and black people, we have to develop a strong economic base. Can you, Dr. Umar Johnson? And can you collaborate with the Dr. Claude Andersons and the Jay Morrisons and the Minister Louis Farrakhan's and Brother Polite and Tariq Rashid and Killer Mike? Is it possible y'all can just collaborate as a collaborate and just build an infrastructure for our people so we can have a strong economic base as well as building schools because it's strength in numbers? Well, Dr. Claude Anderson is a good friend of mine, and uh, we collaborate on a regular basis. Most recently, 
We shared the stage in Boston, Massachusetts, and we'll be sharing the stage again in Washington, D.C. at the annual Power Talk uh, presentation on Saturday, June the 24th. So he's someone who I'm in regular contact with. He's someone whose identity kind of uh, lines up with my own. As far as collaboration, as other individuals I work with as well, some of them are not so uh, known, if you would, within the conscious community or even within the black America uh, community. Uh, for me, I'm always looking for people who are sincere. Um, I know in the public, you know, when y'all see people talk black talk, y'all assume everybody's automatically sincere. I'm not of that persuasion. I look a whole lot deeper than what people say, and I look a whole lot deeper than people you might see on YouTube or on television. So my, my, my standards that I look for when I collaborate with people is a lot deeper than the public. I know with social network and all the hype and hoopla that surrounds black consciousness, people assume that everybody talking about black issues really care about black people. I don't make that assumption. But I do have a lot of people who I do collaborate with, uh, but obviously being a Garveyite who bleeds red, black, and green, Green, um, it's going to be very important that the people I do collaborate with share some of the precepts and foundational uh, core beliefs that we share as Pan-Africanists. So it has to be race first. It cannot be multicultural. We must be exclusively concerned about the best interests of black folk. It cannot have any type of tolerance for LBGT uh, 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 invasion. And so there are certain things that have to, uh, you know, have to be put out and made crystal clear. And most importantly, what we do has to be done exclusively for the benefit of the community and not for the benefit of our own pockets. And so when you put those criteria into motion, uh, certain individuals, not necessarily the ones you mentioned, but generally speaking, certain individuals will not meet that criteria for me to work with them. Uh, but again, there's a lot of brothers and sisters I do work with who I do collaborate with. So that's not and has not been an issue for me. But I would say that one of the greatest detriments of the black consciousness community, in my opinion, and I think I can give my opinion since I am the most requested black scholar on the planet, one of the detriments is that many of the people involved in this work, they're not in this to really make a difference. They're in this to make a dollar. Mm. Wow, wow. Now, you just broke down layman's term. You said some of these leaders are in it for the dollar. Is it possible for either you or T.D. Jakes or, let's say, Pastor Gino Jennings, is it possible for y'all can collaborate where you can actually empower the mindsets of our people, or is it just always going to be individualism? Well, as I said, uh, collaboration is absolutely necessary, and as I said, there are individuals who I already collaborate with. There's certain plans and things that I'm already working on, not just in America. I'm a Pan-African, and so across the world, for that matter, things that I'm not at liberty to speak on just now because they're too delicate to be exposed, you know, at this point. So all work is teamwork. All progress is teamwork. I would argue one of the biggest reasons we haven't made more progress as Africans here, there, and everywhere, not just in America, but the reality is everywhere. Mm. One of the reasons we haven't made more progress is we do not work together. Mm. I was down in Chinatown earlier today, Chinatown, uh, Philadelphia. I had to go pay a parking ticket. And I'm in Chinatown, and not my first time. You know, I grew up in Philadelphia, but they have their own banks. They have their own hospitals. They have their own community centers. They have their own restaurants, their own plazas. They are a self-contained operation in the cities, in the center city district of Philadelphia. So this is the power base of white financial capital. And right in the power base of white financial capital, which you would not expect to find in Chinatown, Chinese people have a self-contained operation right next door to white power. So we have to work together. The reason Chinese and Arabs and East Indians and Latinos can outwork and outpace black folks is because they do not suffer from the radical individualism of American Negroes. They are very organized and they are very, they are very unified. And so um, because of that, they make more progress. We don't have that. So, yes, we do need collaboration. Now, with regard to the past that you mentioned, I don't know them personally. So I don't know if I collaborate, collaborate, can collaborate with them or not. I do know that most Christian pastors and most uh, Muslim imams are handicapped and, 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 and uh, straightjacketed to a multiculturalist ideology. 
I am not interested in anything that is multicultural. Black people need leadership that's going to be exclusively dedicated to their, their own best interests. And I really don't see, and I don't want to speak prematurely because I've never had a conversation with the man, mm-hmm. but I really don't see how T.D. Jakes, given his platform and the relationships that he has with white Christianity, how he could ever stand up for an unapologetically African race first RBG platform. I just don't see it. And it's not just him. I'm just naming him because you named him. But I think if you look at most of um, medium sized to mega church, black Christian and Muslim leaders, most of them will not be caught dead working with Dr. Umar Johnson because of what I represent. And in America, Multiculturalism is the new fad. LBGTism is the new fad. Mm. And if you're not pushing multiculturalism and LBGTism, then you're not going to be well received by white folks. And many of those people, celebrity pastors, celebrity imams, and celebrity black leaders, they are not interested in being on the opposite side of white power. I could care less about white power. I'm trying to build black power. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I know in the past when uh, Pastor Gino Jennings, where he was actually um, elaborating to the world on the the cable network that when he talks about uh, gay issues, he basically said that the network shut them down. Why is it when it comes to important issues that certain networks will shut you down? Well, we have to realize the media is an extension. It is an arm of military science. Media is military science. Real housewives is military science. Scandal is military science. Empire is military science. The NBA playoffs is military science. There has never been an army in modern history. We can go back to World War I as a start point, modern history. There's never been an army that did not have a propaganda campaign. The propaganda campaign is essential. Why? Because it kills the identity, it kills the reputation of the victim uh, intellectually in the minds of the public before you kill them physically. So before Adolf Hitler began to execute European Jews in Germany, he had a propaganda campaign that lasted over a year. Adolf Hitler had plays, Adolf Hitler had books written, Adolf Hitler uh, used newspapers and radio to do what? On a daily basis, brainwash the German public into believing that European Jews were, as he called them, useless eaters, that Germany and Europe and the world would be better off without European Jews. This is what Adolf Hitler preached. America is no different. If you want to mass incarcerate black men, if you want to exterminate black men, before you can begin the physical campaign, there must first be a propaganda campaign to do what? Kill the image of black males and black women and black boys in the image of the global public. So by the time you start killing Trayvon, by the time you start killing Michael Brown, by the time you start uh, killing Sandra Bland and Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Alton Sterling, nobody will speak up for these people because you have already convinced the world through athletics and convinced the world through radio and motion picture and convinced the world through newspaper that the whole world would be better off without black people. So we have to realize that the reason he gets shut down or anybody gets shut down when they start talking true politics is because white supremacy doesn't deal in truth. White supremacy is scared of truth. White supremacy is based on lies. And any campaign that is based on lies wants nothing to do with the truth. What you watch on television is all scripted. The news is scripted. The shows are scripted. Even the reality shows are scripted. Nothing is coming to you in the full truth of what it is. Everything is propagated. And so the problem with us as Africans in America, we are actually the first group of people marked for extermination who have willingly participated in the assassination of their own public image. I'm not aware of a population of people that have ever been marked for extermination, for genocide, who actually participated in the extermination of their public image. You did not see Jews in Germany Mm. putting out music that advertised the negativism about who they were. You didn't see Jews creating television shows that actually advertised and broadcasted the dominant negative stereotypes that Germany had about them. And I could be wrong, but I'm a researcher, I'm a historian in my own right. Mm. I'm not aware of any population marked for genocide who participated, who actually helped 
the power structure destroy their image on the road to destroying their physical bodies. Mm. Wow. Now, when you break down this phenomenal content, Dr. Umar Johnson, you are actually shaking up the world, and I really do appreciate God getting into you and becoming the man that you are today. You are experiencing a life-changing, powerful interview, and you are hearing it first from Arthur Robinson Jr.'s PowerfulInterviews.com. I know a couple of years back, the Jews basically got over $150 million in reparations. Can you explain to the listeners... Why do they get reparations and our brown and black people help build this nation, but we don't have access to reparations at all? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, the German Holocaust against the European Jews was financed from the United States of America, Wall Street. Mm. They will never admit that. But Adolf Hitler's financiers, and you can do your research on this. There's more than enough books been written on it. You can find the documentation irrefutable proof that it was white capitalism and Wall Street bankers who financed Adolf Hitler. So America mm. helped finance that. So that's part of the reason they get reparations. The other part of that is that they identify as a state. They identify as an independent nation of people. They embrace their Jewish nationality. They do not consider themselves to be a subset of an existing nation. That is the mistake of black America. We consider ourselves to be a subset of an existing nation, i.e. the United States of America. Reparations are given to independent nations, whether it be a geographically based nation or whether it be a cultural nation. You cannot get reparations as long as you identify as a subset of an, of an existing part of a nation. And I really believe that we're going to have to change our paradigm. Black America is going to have to shift paradigms away from identifying as African-Americans and start identifying as Africans in America, African prisoners of war held in bondage in America, because that's exactly what we are. We are under this illusion of inclusion that suggests if we identify as American citizens, we will be able to get more. That is totally wrong. If you disidentify as American citizens, you will be able to get more because populations who are in exile, just like refugee populations, they're given a degree of international protection, which is what we need, which allows us to take our issues to world court. But as long as we remain nothing more than subjects of the American government by claiming this, this uh, falsified uh, American citizenship, we can only seek redress through America's courts. We can only seek redress through America's courts. So taking one white man to court to another white man is ultimately going to leave you exactly where you started out because there's no court in America, not one, that will ever declare white supremacy to be illegal. They will declare segregation to be illegal. They might declare miseducation to be illegal. They might declare racial profiling to be illegal. They might declare... Um, redlining black folks out of bank loans to be illegal, but you will never get a court in America, never have, never will, to say that white supremacy is illegal. White supremacy is the foundation upon which America was built, and if you're going to take white supremacy out of America, you will have to change the name of the country. Mm, wow. Now, when President Obama was in office and uh, – you know, basically, I like to say, you know, evil Barack liquidating Africa. And I know Africa is like the richest continent in the world. Now, basically, Africa is our original home, but we can't go back to our original home because we live over here. And I know that the other nationalities or other cultures can go back to their original home if they mess up here. Can you explain to the listeners how important it is that our culture as brown and black people that we should get to know Africa and should we go over there and visit Africa in regards to the culture? Uh, without question, first of all, nothing is stopping anybody from going over to Africa. Um, there's, there's not a country on the continent that will refuse any black person who wants to visit or relocate. Now, I would say that one of the things that the African Union needs to improve upon at present there is no regulation or application 
that allows Africans from the diaspora to apply for dual citizenship in Africa. Now, that right there is the limitation that has to be changed. However, there are forces within the Pan-African movement that are trying to uh, influence the African Union and all of its member states to allow Africans in America the ability to start declaring dual citizenship. That would be powerful. Um, where, in fact, Africans are the only people in the world who, or African Americans, are the only population in the world who are not allowed to have a dual citizenship. So, for example, if an Italian is born in America, they can get dual citizenship in Italy. If a European Jew is born in America, they can get dual citizenship in Israel. That's precisely why during the Olympics, if you notice, many American uh, superstars, basketball, uh, track stars, swimmers, they will go and participate in the Olympics. They will go and participate in the Olympics of their native homeland. They do it all the time. Vladi Diva and all these others. They're American citizens, but they're also citizens in their native land. We don't have that right. Blacks in America don't have the right to dual citizenship. So we are we are landlocked as being only participating here in the United States of America. And that's something that that has to change. But as far as us going back, repatriating back to Africa, black folks have been repatriating back to Africa ever since we got to America. It's something that we have never stopped. It's something that we have never stopped. There's books that's been written on black folks who have tried to go back home and to build up societies, and they have done it. Uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia are two examples of African nations that were largely forged out of the work of African who repatriated back home. Now, of course, there were some issues there because some of us came back with the same type of self-hate and post-traumatic slavery disease that we had in America, which led us to believe that we were better than our African indigenous brothers and sisters. So wars were fought in Liberia between the so-called America Liberians, those who came back from slavery, and those who had never left for slavery. And we basically internalized the white man's superiority complex and thought we could go back to Africa and dictate to our brothers and sisters who were already there. And that led to a very long war, the scores of the scars of which are still in Liberia to this day. And that's why I would argue, as a psychologist, that mental reconstruction, Mental rehabilitation is going to be absolutely necessary in order for black people to do what we need to do. Let me be very clear with you. We are not at a loss for economic resources. We are not at a loss for intellectual resources. We are not at a loss for political resources. Our problem is psychological. Black people don't give a damn about the collective. Everyone is striking out for their own best interests, and they can care less what happens to another black person. I always make the joke. If you have black people over your house visiting and you want them to go home, you're ready for your company to depart, all you have to do is bring up a conversation on how we can raise money to help solve the problems of black America. I guarantee you all of your house guests will be gone within 60 minutes. Black people are not interested in participating in anything that has to do with us. But, if, but guess what? Those same black people that walked out of your house when you brought up solving problems for black folks, mm-hmm. bring up solving problems for homosexuals. Bring up solving problems for women. Bring up solving problems for multiculturals. Bring up solving problems for the United States government. Bring up solving problems for the church, for the fraternity, for the sorority. They will stay all night. But when you say black folks, they disappear. We are not interested in ourselves, and the whole world knows it. And that's why the genocidal campaign against black people is so effective, because there's very few black organizations that exist to exclusively look out for us. For example, are you aware that every black fraternity and sorority, and I respect all of them, tremendous history, but they're all multicultural. None of them are exclusively dedicated to black folks. None of them. The NAACP is not exclusively dedicated to black folks. It's multicultural. The Urban League is not exclusively dedicated to black folks. It's multicultural. All of your community-based organizations are multicultural. But guess what? When I was in Chinatown today, mm-hmm. it was a Chinese Improvement Association, Chinese wow. Community Center. Chinese Economic Development Center, every single people are exclusively dedicated to themselves except us. We want to save everybody except black people, and that's why we haven't saved anybody. Mm, Wow. Now, Dr. Umar, you are dropping some underground information to me and the listeners, and I know it's over 800 media outlets out there and 
basically, I don't even watch the news, because when you turn on the news, all you see is rape, pillage, plunder, recession, depression, you're getting dumped with negativity. But what people should be putting into their mental garden is positivity, information for people who are doing well. Information for people who are not dwelling on tragedy, more on success. So I don't like what I see what's on the news, so I create my own news. Yes, sir. I'm still with you. You still there, my brother? I'm here. Okay. Now, you didn't finish that question off, I don't think. You said you create your own news. What did you say after that? Uh, uh, actually, I ended it right there. Okay. Give me that question again. I apologize. Well, I was saying I don't like what I see what's on the news, so I create my own news. Oh, we have to. I mean, one thing we need to do as a people is we need our own Pan-African Intelligence Network. How did you know when Hurricane Katrina hit? The reason you knew that Hurricane Katrina hit is because CNN and C-SPAN and USA Today and the New York Times, they all told you. But had, had not white people told you that there was a crisis in New Orleans, you would have never known about it. Mm. How, did we, how did we know about the Rwandan massacre back during the Clinton years? Had the white folks not told you, you would have never known about the Rwanda massacre. In other words, our ability to learn about what's affecting our global African family has to come to us from our enemies. That is a very dangerous situation to be in. That means there could be martial law in New York against black folks. And black people in Philadelphia two hours away where I am don't even know about it. That is a, a particularly Dangerous reality for black people globally. We do not have an independent source of news. Now, we'll watch Al Jazeera, we'll watch BBC, but those are Arab and British-controlled media outlets, and neither one of them care about black folks, and both of them have their own agendas for Africa and black people. So if you look at us right now, and this is why the works of His Excellency, the preeminent prophet of black leadership and pan-Africanism, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, this is why we need to gravitate to Garvey's teachings as the most significant pan-Africanist of all time, because Garvey told us that you have to be prepared. Garvey said it over and over again. Be prepared, my black people, for what is coming to you. We're not prepared for war. We're not prepared for public school shutdown. Right now, Donald Trump's new Secretary of Education, Ms. Betsy DeVos, has a a school voucher initiative where she wants to continue to defund public school uh, by pushing the school vouchers. Now she wants to give parents, you know, a check to take their child to a private school. And this voucher program is not going to benefit black people. Why? Because two-thirds of our children are being raised in single-parent homes by mothers who are even working poor, or even if they're middle class, don't make enough money to pay for private education for multiple children. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen if you give a check to a black mother in Philadelphia, say his five thousand dollars ticket to any white private school, any white Catholic school in Philadelphia, and the black mother says, "I got three kids, so you're giving me five thousand for each. That's fifteen, but the private school I want my child to go to costs fifteen grand. Mm-hmm. So where am I going to get the other thirty thousand for my child? She's not going to get it. So the voucher program only benefits middle to upper class blacks. And if you don't care about other black people, you will go ahead and support vouchers because it works for you and your family." It works for you and your family. But 30 years from now, God forbid, when you or your child get uh, strong arm robbed, okay, you get stuck up and robbed or your house gets vandalized, and then you're the first people cursing out black folks when the truth of the matter is you're the reason you got robbed because that same kid who robbed you 15, 20 years ago was that same child that was denied a quality education because you voted for vouchers instead of voting for community control of the public school. So it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. Y'all, when karma came back and backfired on you. Mm. It's the same thing we're talking about now when we talk about what's happening to black youth. You keep hearing black people talk about what's wrong with our kids. We are what's wrong with our kids. We groomed them. We raised them. We let TV and video games and Facebook and Instagram raise our kids. And this is exactly what you got. A whole generation of politically confused self-hating black youth who don't care about nothing but being seen on social network, smoking weed, having sex, and making money. Mm. We created this generation. And that's not all the youth. I know a lot of shining examples of black youth. But when we look at the general predicament, the general mentality of black youth, 
I would have to say that this is probably the worst generation we've ever raised in this country. It's the worst, and it's totally our fault. I do not blame the children. Children are children, and they cannot be made responsible for the way that they act, think, and feel. They're supposed to be nurtured. That's why every community socializes and educates their youth. Chinese community socializes and educates. Jewish community socializes and educates. Chinese community socializes and educates. Anglo-Saxon community socializes and educates. The black community neither socializes nor educates their children, with one exception, black church, where they teach black kids to worship white Jesus. Wow. That, that is absolutely true. Now, my son just turned nine, and uh, unfortunately, he attends a Catholic school, as I literally speak, and I wanted to get him out of the public school systems, and I know that the charter school systems is basically shutting down, and they're being overpopulated and uh me and my wife had a meeting with the principal and you know she's european and um now i know that the national anthem i told my son do not sing that and i wish i would have known that or my parents would have known that because i wouldn't even participate in singing the, national anthem. the national anthem yes he doesn't have to say that first amendment protections follow our children into the school every day. And First Amendment protects freedom of speech and expression. Right. Your son has a right not to pledge the flag. He has a right not to stand for the pledge. He has a right not to sing the national anthem or any other religious or nationalistic song. That's a freedom of speech protection under the First Amendment. Exactly, and he and he doesn't, and we, me and my wife addressed that to the principal. Now, Francis Scott Key invented those lyrics to the national anthem, and I know that he was an author and a lawyer and a slave owner. Can you explain to the listeners, Dr. Umar, why wasn't this information available to our parents when we was coming up in from first grade all the way to the 12th grade? Well, no racist institution wants its victims to be aware of any rights or privileges that they have that can be used to fight against the system. So when you get charged with a crime, the court doesn't want you to know how to stand up to it. It's the same thing with the public school system. The last thing public education wants is a black parent that is educated about their educational rights. I'm working on a book right now, a workbook, and it's interesting you brought this topic up because it's, it's, it's nothing but letters. It's, mm. it's going to be called Black Parent Advocate. Black Parent Advocate, your pen is your weapon. And it's going to be a collection of letters that parents can use and adapt for their own purposes whenever they go into a situation at school. So, for example, I have a letter that says my child was told that they had to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. The United States Supreme Court had already ruled on this back in 1943 in the case for West Virginia that children do not have to recite or stand for the pledge. So I'm requesting an apology to my family on behalf of the fact that your teacher abused her power by demanding something of my child that was illegal and not constitutionally violent. So I'm working on a whole set letter if you want your child to evaluate it, letter if you want to refuse the evaluation, letter if you don't agree with the IEP because our parents don't know how to engage the system. They go to the meetings and they let the schools dictate. Stop letting schools dictate. You have equal power until you give it away. You have you are the most powerful person in that school meeting, but we often give our power away because schools have a way of not flat out lying to your face but they have a way of subliminally suggesting things to you that are not true. So you always hear parents say, I thought I could. I thought they could. So then when you say, did they actually tell you that they could? No, they didn't say that. I thought. Why did you think? Because they have a way of making suggestions to you that ultimately lead to you doing exactly what they want you to do, but that they cannot be challenged because they never actually said it. They only suggested it. So, for example, they suggest that you get your son evaluated for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You went out and got him evaluated. You let me know, and then I say, why would you get your son evaluated for ain't no daddy at home disorder? All they want to do is put him on medication. Why did you do this? Well, I thought I had to. See, they never told you you had to. 
Mm. They just suggest it. You would have to suggest. So the first thing I need black parents to do is stop assuming that you don't have a right to refuse. You have a right to refuse everything in the school. You have a right to refuse the eval. You have a right to refuse uh, the placement. You have a right to, there's so much you can just say no to. And black parents really need to learn how to just say no in these public schools because going along with what they want us to do is destroying the lives of our children. One of the biggest issues that I'm going to have to deal with over the next 30 days is what? Black parents all across America are contacting me because they found out that their children will not be getting a high school diploma. That's mm. what I'm going to have to deal with next. Because, see, under the new laws, no child left behind, special ed kids have to take and pass the same assessments as the regular ed children. They have to take and pass the same assessments as the regular ed children. You don't know that, though. If your child been a special ed since, since kindergarten and now they're up in 12th grade, you don't know that that child is not going to get a diploma because when you were in special ed as a child, you still got a regular diploma, but that was 30 years ago. It's a new day. So now the special ed kids have to pass the same test as the regular kids, and if they can't, there will be no diploma. And guess when they're going to let parents know this? Guess when you're going to find out that your child is not getting a diploma after 12 years? You're going to find out two weeks before graduation day. That's how they do us. Mm. Wow. This is an incredible interview, and I appreciate you coming on my show today, Dr. Umar. No problem. And let me also say, for the benefit of your listeners, mm -hmm. I offer a free black parent teleconference call. A free oh. black parent teleconference call every Tuesday morning from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If any of your listeners have a question regarding their child, education and mental health, the line is only for children. This is not a political line. It's just for education and mental health support. They can call in. It's free. The number is 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158. And the access code is 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. On top of that, if any of your listeners want to become a part of one of the existing National Independent Black Parent Association chapters, they can either email me, drumarjohnson.com, through the website, or they can email drumarjohnson at yahoo.com, and, and I will forward them the information to the chapter president in the city where they live. We have 25 chapters which means there's a lot of cities that don't have presidents. So I'm hoping some of your listeners will be motivated enough to help us help our parents and protect our children by joining me in Detroit June 9th and 10th for the required uh, chapter president training for the Parent Association. And so, um, again, I can be reached at 844 4 dr Umar. The toll-free number is 844-4-D-R-U-M-A-R. That's how they can reach me. We're also going to Africa this summer. From approximately July 27th to August the 9th, we'll be going to Ghana, Togo, and Benin. We'll be visiting the slave dungeons. We'll be getting traditional African names at a traditional African naming ceremony. We will be participating in the Independence Day celebration. We will visit the hometown of the Saint La Overture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, we will also be going to uh, some of the most sacred and spiritual places on the continent in Africa, the Adinkra Factory, the Kente Claw Factory. It's going to be a powerful 12-night experience, a powerful experience. If anyone's interested in going to Africa with me, registration will be ready Monday. Again, they can call that number. They can reach me to the website. But they could also text me on my personal cell number at 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. And lastly, we have the Black College and Consciousness Tour. For those listeners of yours that have children between the age of 11 and 17, 14 days and 14 nights from June 28th to July the 12th, we'll be leaving from Atlanta for 11 to 17-year-old black boys and girls only. We'll be going this year to Morehouse, Tuskegee. Tennessee State, Lamone Owen College, Spelman. We'll be going to Fisk. We'll be going to the Oyotunji African Village, the Charleston, South Carolina Slave Tour, the George Washington Carver Museum, the National Civil Rights Museum, the Selma African Holocaust Institute, the Montgomery Civil Rights Institute. So many different places that we're going to be going on. 14 days, 14 nights, we will give your child an intellectual insurrection like none they've ever experienced. The cost of the tour is $2,000. I don't make any money. That money goes to the traveling. It goes to the hotels. It goes to the meals, and it goes to the other things that we're going to be doing. We take them to the amusement park. We take them to the beach. We also um, take them to play paintball. It's going to be a very, very, very uh, fun and enjoyable experience. So if anyone's interested in that, they will also be able to call me 
text me or reach me through email, but uh, I should hopefully have that whole tour rounded out by the end of this month. Mm, wow. Now, they have to have their passports, correct? Not for the Africa tour. Excuse me, not for the college tour. Remember, that's in the state. Okay. So we'll be covering Atlanta, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Georgia, and possibly South Carolina. For the Africa trip, yes, they need to get they need to have a passport because you have to get a visa for Ghana. We'll get visas to Togo and Benin once we're on the ground. The trip is going to be forty one hundred dollars. Everything is included except one meal per day and you're spending money. You are experiencing a life-changing, powerful interview, and you are hearing it first from Arthur Robinson Jr.'s PowerfulInterviews.com. To everyone that's listening, I highly recommend go to Dr. Umar Johnson's website and get involved with this phenomenal experience that he just expressed to each and every one of you. Dr. Umar, can you explain to the listeners what is the best advice that you 